Let us worship God together as we read responsibly the call to worship, which is taken from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We now get to sing the tune that uh, Sue just played. We gather together, number 559. Confession is a matter of the mind. It takes some brain power to count up six days' worth of sins. But confession is also a matter of the heart. As Richard Foster says in his book on prayer, if our hearts are so narrow as to see only how others have hurt and offended us, we can't see how we have offended God and so find no need to seek forgiveness. But with the assurance that we need to seek God's forgiveness for at least something, and absolutely confident that God is eager to freely forgive us, let us confess our sins together and then speak privately to God with our private confessions of sin. Let us pray together. Loving God, we bask in your grace, but we're quick to deny it to others. We beg your forgiveness but we're quick to judge others unforgivable. We're jealous of your love. Gracious God, don't give up on us yet. We're here to hear once again how Christ can heal us, forgive us, and even make us more Christ-like. Lord, forgive us and make us new. Amen. Jesus said, forgive and you will be forgiven. Don't judge and you won't be judged. Be compassionate as your heavenly Father is compassionate. The truth is God forgives us and still loves us. Thanks be to God.
be seated. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian. I invite you to reach for the friendship pads on the central aisle. Please take those and sign and pass it along the pew, observing the names of those in worship with you on this beautiful but cold winter day. Special welcome to guests and visitors. In front of you is a card in the pew rack with a red ribbon on it. It would be helpful to us if you would put it on, particularly to those sitting in front of you or behind you who do not have the benefit of the friendship pad. At the close of the service, we invite all for a time of coffee and fellowship in the Balkan parlor. If you are sitting next to visitors, either a single person or a couple or a family, uh, please invite that individual or individuals to the Balkan parlor. The pastors, after we greeted the doors, will go to that room, and we look forward to meeting all of you, both members and guests alike. If you would like uh, to receive information about the church, there's a place to check on the friendship pad, your uh, interest in doing that or in receiving a visit. You may so uh, indicate as well. If you would like to speak with someone at the close of the service, there will be an officer in this room to my right who is prepared to talk with you about how one becomes a member by transfer of letter from another congregation in the Christian community or by reaffirmation of faith if it has been some time since you've been active in a local Christian congregation or by profession of faith and baptism. And there's also the procedure of affiliate membership for college and university students, those in the military, those who, in the area, who are in the area for a short period of time. I saw several Peace College students come in, and we have others here from State and from Meredith and from other colleges and universities uh, in the Triangle area in, in worship this Sunday morning. Also in this room is a Stephen Minister. You've heard about that from Bob Inskeep. Uh, that individual is there to receive uh, information or to coordinate the, uh, the giving of uh, a caregiver uh, where needed. In the pews are lavender cards for prayer requests. This is a congregation which takes seriously an accessory prayer. If you have a prayer request, it may be turned in the offering plate, or if you feel it is uh, more confidential, it may be placed in one of the uh, wooden boxes in the vestibule, the entranceways into the sanctuary area. Again, uh, good morning and welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church as we gather on this Lord's Day. Our hymn is a hymn number 367, Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. Uh, the sanctuary choir will sing the first two stanzas and refrain, and then we shall stand beginning at uh, the refrain before stanza three and join with the choir. We'll stand at the appropriate time.
Let's prepare ourselves to hear God's word read and proclaimed by praying for illumination. God of all wisdom, we remember the prayer of the psalmist, you desire truth in the inward being, so please teach me wisdom in my secret heart. We pray that your Holy Spirit will enlighten our hearts and minds as we hear your word this day, read and proclaimed in this gathering of the faithful. Amen. The Psalter lesson is from Psalm 37. Answers that uh, eternal question, why do the evil prosper? And if the reprobates are doing so well, what's the advantage of coming to church? Well, the psalmist reminds us to trust in God, and we will see the difference. So don't fret. Listen for the word of God. Don't fret because of the wicked. Don't be envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord. And the Lord will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. The Lord will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Don't fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Don't fret. It only leads to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Yet a little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our Old Testament lesson today is from Genesis chapter 45, verses 3 through 11. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children, and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson is from the Gospel of Luke, the sixth chapter, verses 27 through 38. Hear now God's word to us. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. 
If anyone strikes you on the tree, cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great as you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Precious God, as we gather on this winter Sunday, we have heard very difficult words for us. But may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I enjoy reading history and even looking at photographical history, and occasionally I get down from a shelf in the living room a book, a very thick volume of a the history of World War II in photographs with an excellent commentary. And each time I get the book down, I'm drawn to a particular photo in that book. It shows two enemies, a soldier bending over and giving a cigarette to an American GI sitting on the ground, looking up at him, extending his hand to receive it. The GI had been captured in the early days of the Battle of the Bulge, a very brutal battle where the U.S. and its allies sustained thousands and thousands of casualties, as well as the German army. Both the German soldier and the American look haggard and they're dirty. But the faces of each show respect for each other. Just hours early, they've been trying to kill each other. But here, there is this reciprocal acknowledgement and respect for each other's humanity as human beings. A scripture from Genesis 45 deals with Joseph and his traitorous brothers. And Psalm 37 addresses how we either fret or do not fret about the wicked. And both are placed in tension with this hard injunction from Jesus. Love your enemies. Do good. Bless. Pray. We say, is this an impossibility? Is this some fantasy statement for a world of perfection in the next life? I mean, are we called upon to do that in this life? Well, yes, hard as it may be, hard as it may be, Jesus says, love your enemies. Well, the focus for the sermon is this. And we'll approach it like walking around and looking at different facets of a picture. But the overall theme is this. As followers of Jesus Christ, as disciples, we are called upon to resist the temptation of retaliating against the enemy and following the behavior patterns from those who have made us victims. Let me say that again. As followers of Jesus Christ, as disciples of the Christ, we are called upon to resist the temptation of retaliating, engaging in a tit for a tat, and drawing our behavior patterns from those who would victimize us. And thus there is the force of the verbs. Love, it's you love in the imperative. It's do good, 
It's bless in the imperative. It is pray in the imperative. The biblical theologian, Dr. Fred Craddock, uh, suggests that at least at the entry level of looking at this, we're not to retaliate and thus to draw our behavior patterns from those who would victimize us, for to do so would become the very beast whom we have despised. So that's sort of a graphic description, but this is an entry level into this. Well, drawing upon the wisdom of many scholars who have looked at this passage over the centuries, and believe me, this is a very difficult passage for folks like you and me who don't like to be abused. And we know that we worship a God as a God of righteousness, of justice, who does not like for anyone to be abused. But when Jesus uses the word love, therein lies the key. What does he mean by this word love? In the context here, Jesus does not mean some artificially created sentiment. Jesus is talking about another dimension of love which moves past sentimentality and feeling, such as like somebody. It's an action of the mind and the will which moves love to another plane. It moves it to participate in the grace of God as mercy toward the individual whom we consider is the enemy. And if we live long enough, we have enemies. Thus, this kind of love is not a feeling as much as it is a action affirming the worth of the individual apart from the terrible action and attitude of the individual toward us and toward others. It is not to condone the sinful act of the individual. Rather, it is to affirm the worth of the individual who, too, needs to be affirmed in spite of his or her attitudes and bad actions, sinful actions, atrocious actions, abusive actions. And friends, that is tough when we've been abused, particularly hard for women who have been abused. It is seeking what is best for the individual apart from the sinful nature of the individual as God's grace through mercy looks at us and separates us in terms of our worth from our sinful actions and attitudes. It is to move to a different plane where we say, how do you do that? This is hard, maybe impossible, but we are called upon to try to resist a temptation, to retaliate, to engage in a tit for a tat. We're called upon to resist, to emulate the behavior pattern of the individuals who have made us a victim at some point in the past, or maybe even the present. I'm a Star Trek groupie, I guess, because I enjoyed going to those movies, taking Ed the Third and Sarah Dale. That was a good excuse to go to see these movies. I enjoyed them all. I still do. And the movie now, it's got to be years old. Because when did Star Trek start? 20, 25 years ago? I mean, when the kids were young. Well, in this movie, Captain Kirk and his crew are commanded by the Admiral of the Space Federation to rendezvous at a certain point in the galaxy and to pick up the ambassador for the Klingons for a surprise peace conference. Well, if you've looked at any of the Star Trek movies, you know that the Klingons are the hated and the despised enemies of the galaxy. You can't trust them. Every previous encounter Kirk and his crew has ever had with the Klingons or even folks and the Space Federation has had, has proven them to be savage barbarians with no moral principles. They're like mad dogs to be exterminated. I mean, he has a hatred for the enemy, the Klingons. And it's personal because the Klingons were responsible for the death of his only son, a PhD researcher. And as the plot unfolds, there is this context inside of Kirk between his heart and his mind. The heart here not used in the biblical sense, where the heart in the biblical sense is both a location of feelings and the willpower and the mind, but heart in the more modern psychology sense of just feelings versus the mind between the hatred of the Klingons on the one hand and what he's called upon in terms of showing respect for the enemy. Because after all, maybe, maybe, maybe it is possible that you can trust Klingons, but he doesn't really believe it. They're the enemy. 
And in the movie, the plot also develops where there are members of his crew who are engaging in a conspiracy to actually to kill the ambassador. And so he's called upon to put into action here, to put into action respect which moves above revenge and a tit for a tat. Well, it's all fiction, but it's not fiction. <laughs> for in real life situations, we're called upon to deal with the same issues in human relationships with those who have violated us, either verbally or physically. If not us, then those whom we like and love. And that's where the Old Testament Genesis account comes in tension here. It's in tension with Jesus' hard injunction, love your enemies. It's the Joseph story. We pick up in the, the latter part of this story. Joseph has to wrestle with revenge. And if you read the chapters right up to this, Joseph is, is right on the cusp of, of, of engaging in a tit for a tat in terms of what he's about, but he does not. And how does he not? He doesn't because he trusts in God to give him a future past the agony of the present and the past. He comes to that place after he has to wrestle with revenge. He trusts in God's kindness to transform hate and revenge into respect and mercy. It would have been easy for Joseph to have engaged in a tit for a tat. His older brothers had sold him into slavery and had fabricated a lie to his father Jacob about how uh, he had disappeared. You know the story. Uh, the brothers had taken his multicolored coat after they had thrown him in this pit and sold him into slavery. He was barely out of puberty. And they had fabricated the story by soaking uh, the coat in blood of an animal that he had been killed by a wild animal. And they showed the coat dripping in blood or with blood stains on it to the father. These were his brothers. Now Joseph is the second most important figure in Egypt behind the Pharaoh. And the brothers have come to Egypt to get grain. There's been a famine for two years. There's five more years to go. They do not recognize Joseph because they sold him into slavery when he was a barely out of puberty. And now he looks like an Egyptian. He's dressed like an Egyptian. And more than that, he's a powerful Egyptian. Joseph can no longer contain himself, and he reveals himself to his brothers. And there's an interesting phrase. Did you hear it when we read? They were dismayed. You better believe they were dismayed. <laughs> wow. If they had been in Joseph's shoes, they know what they would have done to people like them. They were dismayed, all right, because they could have been obliterated by Joseph. But Joseph gives a theological rationale because of what he has been through in terms of trusting in the law to have a future beyond the present, past all the agony he had gone through and lived through. He talks about the fact that God was going to take what was done for a higher purpose. He's more clear about that later on in chapter 50, verse 20, when it says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Well, to arrive at that conclusion takes a big leap of faith, friends. To live past the horror of abuse takes faith. And Joseph was saying by what he said that he trusted in God's grace and strength to rise above being a victim. In essence, Joseph is living out the encouragement we read from Psalm 37, which says, do not fret because of the wicked. To trust in our futures with God is to move past the chaos through which we're living now. It's to have the present transformed because of our faith in God that we may be victimized, but we will not be a victim. Because of our faith in God, our souls are not held in bondage to what we are going through, terrible as it may be, day after day. We will not be victimized if our trust is in God, even though we have been victimized. Because of trusting in God, we're able to transcend that. And by doing that, we do not become a victim for the second time. The first time because of what was done for us, the second time because of what we do to ourselves by addressing the, the hurt of those who have uh, victimized us by retaliating, 
we become a victim for the second time because of hatred which poisons us. To trust in God, to trust in our futures past the chaos of the present is somehow to be able to transcend and to become part of the overall grace and mercy of God. He puts it in theological terms. You meant it for evil. God now is meaning that for good. And by how he deals with them, he then becomes part of their own transformation to rise above and to ask for forgiveness for their own victimization of Joseph. There's an old hymn in the Red Hymn Book. It's under the seat entitled, God is Working His Purposes Out. Thought about singing that this Sunday. And there's a line in that hymn which goes, that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is working his purposes out. When you truly trust in God and do not fret after the wicked, to fret after the wicked is to engage in revenge. It is to be so caught up in hatred that you've got to engage in the tit for a tat and you become a victim for the second time. But to trust in God is to trust in the future past what is going on. And to trust in God in confronting the enemy is to do what Jesus calls for us to do, which is so difficult, move past sentimentality move past liking the individual whom we despise. It is moving to the place where we love in action through showing respect for the worth of the individual, even though we may despise what that person has done to us or to others. It is to bless the individual, to pray for the individual, to do for others just as God through Jesus Christ does for you and me, intercedes for us, for friends, we receive grace through mercy. What if God did to us what we deserve? What if Joseph had done to his brothers like they deserved? I've used this individual as an example, and I apologize for it, but it's the best example I have about someone who was able to transcend and to love an enemy despite all the terrible things the enemy had done to him. Uh, Presbyterians have minds like elephants. They don't forget, particularly when you use an illustration. You may forget what the preacher says, but you will never forget an illustration. And so you probably maybe remember the story about Will Campbell, Dr. Will Campbell, an author, pulpit orator, civil rights activist, an ordained Baptist minister, educated at Yale, grew up in the South, his ministry was in the South. I first met him. Uh, he was one to move, push me off the dime in terms of getting involved and racial justice in Memphis, Tennessee. He came to Memphis at the behest of the governor of the state of Tennessee. He was the chairman of the Commission on Human Relations, and he was called in to intervene in the midst of a very much a crisis in Memphis, the sanitation strike by workers against the city of Memphis, and things were polarized. Martin Luther King was on the way, and this was before Dr. King was assassinated. But Will Campbell, by the force of his personality, I was called there as well as other Presbyterian pastors to meet in the mayor's office with individuals in the community. We won't get into that story. That's another whole story, what happened after all that. But Will Campbell finally retired. We all have to retire sometime. Get old. He's an old warrior, was. He had fought many spiritual crusades, and he had given his life and those crusades for, for social and racial justice. Over the years, he had been threatened. He had been shot at. He had had crosses burned in front of his house by the Ku Klux Klan. But he was now retired. And he retired to the mountains of North Carolina and purchased a farm. And down the road from him, down this dirt road, was a farmhouse beat up where there was another old warrior, but the enemy, the enemy. The man had been imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Enemy. Despicable in terms of what had been done to people. He learned that the old man had contracted cancer. And because, I guess, of the contentiousness in that group, not many of his colleagues ever came to see him. I guess once you get out of the sheet, you don't want anybody to know who you are. And he was a pretty, pretty visible person and knew he had been a Ku Klux Klan, so folks didn't come to visit this fellow. But Campbell wrestled with what he was to do, and he took a deep breath and decided he would do what Jesus 
commanded, tough as it was. And so he went down there and offered his services to the wife. And he became an aide, carrying out the bedpans, washing the old man. And during the course of several months, by doing this, putting love into action, praying with the fellow, blessing the fellow in terms of showing mercy and respect, that was his transformation. Claiming the future of God past the present, past all the chaos through which he had lived through in terms of being shot at, in terms of being abused, in terms of having crosses burned in front of his home, in terms of the fear put in his family and his children. Well, one evening a request came from his wife, please come. And Campbell went and had prayer with this imperial wizard before he died. Campbell said, that was one of the toughest decisions he had to make in terms of doing love when he didn't feel like doing love. But you know, when you do love, when you do bless him, when you do pray for, something happens. Because in that moment, you're able to transcend and somehow participate in the grace of God as mercy. Somehow we're able to participate in what we read about in our call to worship, what was accomplished through the cross and through the resurrection in terms of the power of God to conquer sin and death, victory over sin, which would cause us to engage in a tit for a tat. The miracle, the power, the resurrection takes place when we as Christians dare to resist a temptation to engage in revenge against the enemy, to, be, to have our behavior pattern follow the example of the one who has victimized us. An imperial wizard, when he died, his last words to Will Campbell were, thank you, Will Campbell, thank you. Jesus from the cross played. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, what they are doing, some translations. The model for us in human relations when we love the enemy is that right makes might and not the reversal. Right makes might. To love our enemies is only possible when we first confess, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Only is it then possible as we participate somehow in that spiritual dynamism of the victory of the cross and the resurrection to rise above revenge to claim our futures which somehow can transform the present and the pain and the agony of being abused, and thus to resist the temptation of a tit for a tat. And because we have been granted grace as mercy, we then are called upon to love the enemy, to do good, and to bless and to pray for the enemy. And we can only do so because of what was accomplished for us through the cross and through the resurrection. No tit for a tat as followers of Jesus Christ, hard as it may be, no tit for a tat. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith using the words from a brief statement of faith which are printed in the bulletin. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives teaching by word and deed, and blessing the children, healing the sick, and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain, and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal.
You may be seated. Let us look to God in a time of prayer. Let us pray. <coughs> Great and holy God, we come before you this day in awe and wonder. You have blessed us in countless ways, and we pause to give you thanks. We thank you for your love and mercy, for your forgiving grace, for the beauty of the world we live in. But most of all, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, who taught us to love and to forgive and who modeled a new way of living. Loving God, you called us to be your faithful followers, yet we are aware of our human limitations and shortcomings in our attempts to do so. Guide us that we might do your will. Give us forgiving hearts, understanding spirits, and help us to break down the barriers that separate us from others. Trusting in your grace and unconditional love, we lift our prayers to you this morning. We pray for all those who struggle with addictions of all kinds, for the innocent victims of violence and oppression, and for those for whom doubt, despair, and defeat are daily companions. We pray for all families, but especially families where there is strife and brokenness. We ask that you give strength to single parents, to those going through separation or divorce, and to families who struggle with challenges and adversities of all kinds. We pray for all those who are sick, facing medical treatments, surgery, or tests. Be especially close to them and give them strength, courage, and the assurance of your presence in the challenges ahead. We pray also for those who have lost loved ones. Comfort them in their time of sorrow. We pray for ourselves, for the forgiveness of all our shortcomings, known and unknown, for those things which we have done and those we have left undone, for closing you out at the times we need you most. Enable us to begin again to serve you in newness of life. We make this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now present unto God our tithes and offerings.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask your blessing on these offerings that we bring. May they truly be a rededication, not only of our resources, but of our very lives. Use them to work for peace and justice in our world and reconciliation and to work for those things in our lives as well. In your name we pray. Amen. Our hymn is number 447, Lead On, O King Eternal. go out to witness as disciples of Jesus Christ in the most difficult of arenas, to love those who have abused us, whose attitudes and actions have abused, uh, abused us. But we do so, witnessing to the power of the cross and the resurrection, that by the grace and the mercy of God, we do not need to remain victims. We can rise above that and indeed show the power of the cross and the resurrection in terms of how we treat with respect those whom we do not admire in terms of their actions, but we treat them as God through Christ treated, as he said from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Love your enemies is hard, but we are called upon as disciples to follow the example of our Lord, difficult as it may be. Now the grace of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of you, both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>